My Zoom is not responding to my commands very well, but I'm here. I'm here. I I'll invite you into a question. What do you need most right now? What do you need most right now in this moment? Your answer may be as simple as, I need Reverend Kate to say something. Or I need a tissue or something to eat. Another cup of coffee. Or it might be, I need a good night's sleep. Or a job, a new home. Perhaps you need to stretch and get out of the house you've been stuck in for three months. Perhaps you need to reconnect with someone you've lost touch with, someone near and dear to your heart, a friend or your father or a son or daughter, a child. Perhaps you need someone to help you carry a hard burden someone to help with the burden and bear witness to a deep sorrow. Perhaps you really need to celebrate something. Have you given yourself permission to scream in joy lately? Is there something that you have found to scream for joy? Or perhaps you don't have an answer that you don't know what you need. Maybe you're feeling numb and disconnected, that you and your body have stopped talking to each other. Perhaps silence is the only response and you get when you ask, what do I need? Silence from your body, silence from your heart and your mind. What's important here is the answer or no answer sets your priorities and it propels you into the next moment. Before you launch into that next moment, I invite you into a place of ambiguity, of discomfort, of discomfort, of not knowing. I invite you to stay in the moment, hang on the balance the precarious, mysterious, full of possibility. On this solstice celebration, we're in a balance. Call it a liminal space that is an, an in-between moment and one and the next, it's in-between, offers a rare opportunity for change. The key is in order to change, to really make do something different to make change happen than our normal operating system to shift our patterns of behavior we have to be uncomfortable and right now i know i'm uncomfortable i suspect many of you are in this country are uncomfortable we've entered a liminal space we exist in a moment of indecision of ambiguity of dis comfort. We're faced with 400 year old epidemic of racism that has reached an overt and undeniable level of personal and systemic need for action. Police are grappling with accusations of over policing and violence. We are deep into a global climate crisis. We have been hidden in our homes and behind masks 
with a raging virus that has killed over 122,000 people in the US and were caught in a capitalistic health care system, leaving thousands in debt at a horrific time. An unemployment rate is hovering around 13.3%, laying bare the awful truth of the vulnerability of the Black, Brown, and Indigenous siblings. We are in an ambiguous moment. Any one of directions we can go in, and we can't be sure what to do and what we need. I actually believe we need to sit in our discomfort just for a little while of discernment and ask, what do we need? Because that sets our choices. It sets our behavior. The discomfort brings up the reality that we need to change. We can't return to the old normal. Change, real change comes from the discomfort. We want to resolve it like a bad mystery. We want that diagnosis, that treatment. We want to reach the end of the story. We want to feel better. We want to resolve the tension and we want it gone. Yet we have to ask, what do we need for our country? And we give the answer time to make us uncomfortable. It will. I think it's going to ask a lot of us. So I'm going to give you a hint at an answer that I've come up with. All of these complex and painful problems are built upon a foundation of domination and colonialism. Our country was built upon the rule of domination and colonialism. And out of this foundation, it is so hard to pull one thread out. Out of all the painful repercussions and fallout from 400 years of power over dynamics of the takeover from the white supremacy, what I'm going to do is pull out on Father's Day one thread, one victim of systemic racism and one victim of police brutality, one victim of the core philosophy of domination and colonialism, and that's black fathers. I hope you caught a story yesterday in the Washington Post. It said it so beautifully. It was a poignant story about Sean Williams and his choices. Sean is living with racial stereotype of the absent black father. He's constantly reminded from strangers and friends who want to reaffirm his decision to not be an absent father to his three children. Sean, you see, is a stay-at-home dad, a perfectly normal choice in a healthy culture, but not in ours. One day, Sean hit a tipping point of frustration when yet another well-meaning white woman stopped him in the store to affirm his choice to be with his kids. Sean checked with other black fathers and heard confirmation that they too experienced a constant reminder of the racial stereotype of the absent black father. So Sean had enough. He knew that the National Center for Health Statistics shows the majority of black fathers stay with their children, are actively engaged in changing diapers, fixing their lunches, getting ready for bed. They dress them and play with their children. Black fathers are more likely to be engaged in fatherhood than their white and Hispanic counterparts. Think about that. Sean knew this. And in his in-between moment, his moment of decision, doesn't matter how long it took, it could have been a split second, it could have been days, he chose to create the dad gang. I want to share some photos with you of this gorgeous, scene of the dad gang. I just love this. Fathers doing their thing, loving their children, defying expectations. There's, they now have branched out. They started with photos with the kids on Instagram and they have branched out to in person events, learning to dance and cooking and teaching their children. And it all went rather viral. 
and now they're doing these in-person events. There's even one here in DC this morning for all fathers to demonstrate the strength of black fatherhood. Sean is changing his narrative. He is healing the damage done to his community. He's taking it into a whole new level and showing that the fallout from a worldview that promotes domination and colonialism is not the only form of power in our relationships. I'll tell you another fallout from the norms of the power over dynamics that comes from domination and colonialism. Across the country, our culture supports that only authority figures are morally obliged to punish or enforce social norms and expectations. If someone breaks a rule or a norm, we all look for the closest authority figure to bring that person back into line or to punish them. The authority figure may be a police officer, a judge, or it may be a minister like myself or a teacher or um, the chairperson of a committee. Not all cultures are like this though, and we humans don't start out this way. A recent study out of Yale University shows that young children, four to seven year olds, believe that peers, their friends, are morally obligated to intervene when someone breaks a social norm. This is peer-to-peer -peer relationship. This is a power with dynamic. Rather than power over, we are with each other in friendship, equality. This leads us to ask, is there a reason why we learn that is not okay to gently hold each other accountable? We learn that the power over relationship, the authority figure is the only power dynamic that we hold as truly valid. And I'm not talking about free range, self-appointed militia plane soldier. That's still a power over dynamic, but without any accountability. No, in this moment of massive ambiguity, of not knowing what is next and what we need, I believe we're being invited to rethink our relationship with power and authority. We don't always need to have a power over, a domination dynamic, nor is it always power with or peer to peer. What we need is flexibility. It needs to be in play to keep people safe. We need to explore and invite a broad social dialogue about how we engage with power and authority because it's impacting every system in our country. It impacts how our fathers interact with children and their families and how mothers and how all of us interact with each other. I think we need a revolutionary dialogue about treating each other with total and complete respect. We must see each other as holy, as precious, as divine participants. We are co-creationists in the journey of life, and this is a part of our faith as Unitarian Universalists, bound in our first and seventh principles, the inherent worth and dignity, and the interdependent web of life. And you may not know, but as Unitarian Universalists, we have a super strength. We have a super gift. That is that we are really good at living with ambiguity. We are really good at being open to questions and uncertainty. It's a way of being in a world and a world that is screaming for concrete, dualistic and black and white answers. But here we are as Unitarian Universalists saying, no, it's okay if we don't have all the answers about God and the universe and heaven and hell and evil and goodness. That's our super strength. And seeing the other as holy, that's bound up in many of our world religions as all. We don't have the market on that one, we share it. It is not unusual to see the other as holy and inherently worthy of love in many of our world religions. But I can tell you, it is politically and socially radical to see the other as worthy and inherently worthy of love and joy as being full of respect and the holy. That is politically and socially radical. And this is how we build a new normal. 
In order to change our course, to create this new normal, we need to pause, to stay in our discomfort of ambiguity, of not knowing what is next, the liminal space of in-between. It is here, it is here in this moment that creativity can happen, when radical acts of love can be born. If we keep moving without the pause, without reflecting, without a crucial decision to change how we view the world and all of life, we will return to the old normal way of doing things because it's comfortable, it's familiar. We'll return to hurting each other and unchallenged biases and those false narratives about each other. Every system wants to stay in equilibrium, but our old normal, our old equilibrium was built on the false narrative of power over and domination. My friends, we are in a precipice moment of dismantling white supremacy, of changing how we engage in power, of viewing all life as sacred in word and deed. We are engaged in the great turning, using Joanna Macy's fabulous term. And in this moment, we find nourishment, our spiritual grounding by practicing, staying in touch with our body. On April 26th, I offered the practice of Joanna Macy's book from Act of Hope. And that practice is a cycle that begins with gratitude, allows us and invites us to stay with our grief and our pain, which then in turn transforms us with our gratitude and that propels us into going forth. This is an endless cycle. It has to be practice. It's a consciousness of asking what do we need? It needs to be done on a very personal level for all the pain in your life, as well as on a global. We ask, what is my next decision going to be? And in this moment, in this in-between, with ambiguity as our super strength, our superpower, this is when we are most open to new ideas and new ways of being. You never know when a rainy day may transform a boy into a pizza. So you may be asking, what do I need? Me, your minister. I need a congregation that works alongside me to create justice, to not be silent in the face of oppression, and to love one another in all life with a fierce abandon. I am blessed to have my needs met by you, Mount Vernon Unitarian Church, members and friends. We are in this together. So now I ask again, what do you need? Pause before you rush to answer. Blessed be and amen.